Mackenzie Johnston with Tri-State Livestock News bringing you discussions concerning fair cattle markets. Today we have the opportunity to chat with Vaughn Meyer of Riva, South Dakota. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're located, and your background within uh, the cattle industry? Uh, we're located about 12 miles southeast of Riva, South Dakota, what used to be the old town of Sorm. And uh, my grandfather homesteaded here in 1909, and I'm the third and, and my son's fourth generation, and I've got the grand, grandkids, the fifth generation, are starting to work here. We basically run a purebred Angus and Red Angus operation. We've been running that since this was, I believe, our 64th year that we sold bulls there this spring. So that's kind of kind of where we're at uh, on there. It's, it's mostly a, a cow-calf purebred operation and very little farming. Only farming we do is for feed sources for the cattle. As far as organizations, I served on the on the state beef council for 11 years and and on the uh, cattlemen's beef board for two terms, six years, and also been a member of RCAF since its inception, I guess. And a member of the stock growers for I don't know how many years. And I've served as as a director and currently serve as vice president in there. And uh, I'm also on the OCM organization for competitive markets uh, board there, and serve there currently as vice president and director. So, what do you feel are the major issues standing in the way of fair cattle markets within our industry today? There's a number of them we've, we've got to address. I guess the the first one is the fact that we're being a lot of captive supplies being used against us, whether it's in the form of, of uh, contract uh, pricing anymore, without a you know cash market discovery and imports. That's another form of, of captive supply. Our own checkoff is is a major factor that funds are being used against us to lobby against those captive supplies to stop us from addressing those issues. We've lost you know country of origin labeling, which was uh, kind of limiting the captive supply of, of imports for several years and and uh, brought our beef numbers up up to where the cattle number finally starting to see parity for their product on there. You know, a lot of the major organization, our, our number one contractor, NCBA, says that it's not true that those funds can't be used against us for lobbying, but those funds definitely are being, once they cross that mythical firewall that they point to, theirs to do whatever they wish with them. So that's probably one of the major factors, and that's what recently has uh, got uh, Ellen May in South Dakota and Brian Hansen and, and myself to work to get other organizations on and, and come about with a petition for a referendum, which has not happened since back in 2002, and, and that petition was kicked, kicked out in the end also. So it really, really didn't ever, haven't ever had a referendum, to my knowledge anyway. The act and the order says that we can have a, re you know, a referendum if we come up with 10% of the people, but it seems like they always find a way around that. Can you explain why our industry needs this beef checkoff referendum and some of the hurdles that we're looking at in order to uh, in order for it to come about? Well, I'd say the number one reason for a beef checkoff referendum is our checkoff is apparently not working for us. We've lost over well, three to 400,000 producers. Our per capita consumption of beef in the United States is, is going down proportionally, you know, where we were hoping that, you know, promotion of beef should, should increase it. Our consumption the last time I looked is about 56 pounds per, per, per capita, and I believe when the checkoff started, we were closer to 80 pounds in that area and uh, you know that those are two major signs of that your checkoff's not working for you when you're losing the producers around you when they're going broke because of the low cattle prices and that if we can get rid of the checkoff we've tried and i've tried and i've got a combined uh, effort there of about 17 years of trying and i'm not alone there's many other people that have done it on, the, on those boards to make changes to that uh, beef checkoff and we're told all the time that you they can't make changes that it's against their, the act and the order to lobby and, and that. When really the act and order says right in there, yes, it's against it for uh, lobbying, but we can also do a form of lobbying to suggest changes to the checkoff. But nobody wants to do that because it's working so well for the other side to pull, pull the dollars away from us and support their agendas. If we can get rid of the checkoff, then we'll go... It's, most of us are in favor of a checkoff of some sort, and we we'll, would we'll hope to be back to the drawing table. Two major things that I see that we, we are asking for is we're asking for exclusively USA beef. We, there's no reason we should have to uh, promote uh, foreign beef in there. And the second one is, is there's no reason that any lobbying organization should be a contractor to our beef checkoff. The checkoff should be opened up to actually 
actually a private enterprise for the efficiency of competition. And it would probably bring about the equivalent of a dollar or two more because of the efficiencies. And when you get into private enterprise, the competition gets strong. And there's a lot of new challenges and ideas that come out that are, would be very worthy for beef producers. Those are two of the main things it would be to include private enterprise limiting policy organizations from being contractors, and the other is to exclusively uh, promote our own product. What kind of hurdles are we looking at with getting this beef checkoff referendum passed? Well, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. It remains to be seen. The first sign-on out here is, is just to get the referendum, and we need 10% of the population out there to do it. I believe the time is there from what I'm, what I'm hearing from folks that they're ready to, ready to have a referendum on there. Once we get the referendum, the big one of the hurdles is to make sure it's a fair and honest vote on there. The last time around, you know, they excluded a lot of people on there saying that post off boxes and stuff like that proved that they weren't farmers and ranchers. Well, a lot of farmers and ranchers do have post off boxes and that. So we almost need, a, to my thinking, I guess, is we need a third party to audit this. Uh, NCBA and USDA are kind of one and the same. There's a revolving door policy there of, of people moving back and forth from one job to the other in there, and, and there's it's, there's a lot of shared beliefs in there and stuff, so it's, to me it would almost, but the, the act in the order just says it will be conducted by USDA, so that's the problem is to make sure that it is a fair and honest signature that they, they don't uh, throw out. Yeah, the, the other problem, I guess I, the major problem that we would like, when I said, you know, that we, we would like to exclusively promote U.S. product and we would like to see it open to private uh, contractors. The, the third thing is, is transparency of, of uh, the money and the audits in there. It's, it's been noted, you know, years back, I, I, I can't remember what years they were now, but about around 2010 that uh, they were caught, uh, our, our largest contractor was caught uh, putting some of their expenses over on the checkoff side and they voluntarily, hurriedly uh, kicked back about $230,000 on, on that deal. And, and that total audit involved about nine days of the actual checkoff since it was in being. So if that's the case, there, there's got to be some really atrocious deals that have happened in the past 35 years. And we've, you know, OCM went forth with a FOIA request for those records back in 2013, and it's just been a stalling tactic and one after another to keep that from being released on there. So under a new checkoff, it would be very important to have total transparency of uh, where the funding's going and that, and uh, open books that could be audited by any cattle person that pays, pays the checkoff at any time they wished. So earlier you mentioned mandatory country of origin labeling. Do you feel that we will see that reinstated in the near future, and how do you see that helping the American cattle producer? In order to be reinstated, we've got to get the Congress behind us. They're using that excuse that WTO is going to put tariffs on us and that. Uh, they never did, never once questioned the fact that what do we need to do to make it viable and, and keep it on there. They just right away came right in by the forces that were lobbying them to just do away with the and uh, Right now, we're, we've been trying for the last two, three years to try and get some congressmen to uh, sponsor a mandatory country of origin labeling bill that would address the three issues that, that they uh, said was wrong with our uh, prior checkoff. Uh, you know, there's too, too many PAC funds being shipped in to these uh, during election time and stuff like that from these organizations, from PAC or uh, corporations. And it's, it's costly to, to rerun for election. So it's difficult to get those people to overlook that and vote for the good of not only producers, but consumers. I mean, we, we got beat coming in from 27 countries. Well, even the USDA admitted here back a month or two ago that they've curtailed some of their inspections and foreign inspections because of lack of funds and, and uh, not doing them as often as they had been. To me, that's that's a real wreck waiting to happen for consumers to bring disease into this country. What are your thoughts on the DOJ investigation investigating our big four beef processors? Do you think we're going to see results from it? And do you think it's going to help the cattle industry in the long run? Well, my first thought is it's, it's been about time. DOJ is has turned a blind eye to all the mergers, whether it be in the packing industry, real seat, chemical businesses, and all that for a long time, which has been not only harming farmers and ranchers, but farmers also and the end consumers in this country. So it's about time. I, I just hope that it can, it's got to be a, a better venue to have it investigated. 
participation in the USDA, which is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a revolving door employment agency between NCBA and themselves. So I, I guess I feel a little more confident about it. It's, it's just a matter of who control it and uh, run it and, and keep the outside influences from putting pressure on it. You know, there's, I hate to admit this, but it's, it's kind of a fact that of all the, even the judicial challenges we've had in the past, where producers have won at one level, usually gets thrown out at the next level because of pressure put on there. You know, at one time when the forefathers set up this country, there were supposed to be you know, checks and balances that kept our judicial system independent and without outside pressure on it. And I think we've, we've seen a lot of change in that in the last few years. For one thing, the Department of Justice has, has uh, really cracked down on, on any uh, mergers or monopolistic practices. I really don't know. I, I guess it remains to be seen on, on what DOJ does on that, if they're, if they're really serious and can do it unbiased without any outside pressure. I, I've got hopes that that's what will happen. What are your thoughts on Senator Grassley's 5014 bill to increase negotiated cash trade? It's one of the best pra- tools that we can use to, you know, there's a number of tools out there that we need, you know, including country origin labeling and, and so on, but that's one of the best tools because we've lost, you know, the contract pricing has, has just overtaken them without even a lot of times the price put into those contracts. The alternative is the 3014, and the 3014 was only about four points above what we had on a national average prior to that, and then it wasn't working for us, so I, I don't understand why we would give them a 70% captive supply to keep using against us. Uh, I think, you know, it should probably be, and a lot of people do 100%, but at least, and some people say, well, well, can't you compromise and start out at 3014? I think 50% is a compromise. And my hat's off to Senator Grassley for taking the, uh, the lead on it. Right now, uh, Congresswoman Cindy Axney, I don't know if she's done it already, but she was going to do it at 2 o'clock on Friday, was introduce similar legislation on the House side. And we worked the weekend trying to get Johnson's office to uh, co-sign on there with her. I had a conversation with him, Johnson yesterday afternoon on my phone call. We were supposed to have a meeting in Lemon on uh, Friday, which he had to forego. And he, he sold on 3014. The Packers are sold on 3014 because they know that that's where they've been. What do you see happening to the American cattle producer if some kind of changes aren't brought about, whether it be MCOOL, whether it be the checkoff referendum, whether it be 5014? What do you see essentially happening to our industry if we don't get some substantial changes? We are going to be vertically integrated, similar to the hog and, and chicken poultry industry. They said it could never happen because of the land and the requirements. They don't need to re- you know, hold our, our uh, facilities like they do in, in both the other two. They've got us uh, at, the, at the marketplace. And uh, the actual ownership of farmland and that will probably be gone in the future. Our young people will never, you know, if they've ever had a dream of, of owning their own farm or ranch, it'll be out the door. The best that they can hope for is to manage cattle for, for a big corporation. And uh, the corporation will decide when and how else they're going to market them. Most of them will probably already be forward contracted before they're even born. The other thing I see is that, you know, I, our industry in the United States is going down. I see the consumers will be eating a lot more global food um, in the future if we don't get a hold on and protect our own food supply here in the United States. So you mentioned the consumer. They've been gouged here for a couple months, and obviously the prices have come down somewhat in the grocery store, but they have not returned to pre-COVID levels. Do you think our industry is in danger of pricing ourselves out of a product if we don't return to uh, normal beef prices? Yes, I, I agree. I think I think we've already done that. I, I hate to say what the effects of this recent run-up of box beef prices have caused to a consumer. I, I've talked to many consumers that have already switched varieties of, of protein. Consumers talk about how good pork is. I mean, pork has been very cheap because of the slaughter supply disruption and stuff like that, and people have realized how, how great it is. And, and we've spent billions of dollars in our checkoff trying to promote beef, you know, and you know, an exclusive product out there that's about poultry and, and we haven't used directly their names, but it's out there and now just in the last half a year we've driven those people away from it. Everybody says, well, the Packers are friend, the Packers are friend. Well, your friend doesn't ruin your, your market and your demand for your product and permanently 
have any closing statements you want to make regarding our cattle markets or any of the issues facing our cattle industry? Well, I guess the only closing thing I would say after I've well said most of them is that it's time for, for producers, young and old alike, and especially young producers, to get out of the mindset that we're getting into business, we're busy, we don't want to be disturbed, let these older people that have been here a while do the, uh, the fight for us, you know, to save our industry and that. If they're going to continue, they're going to have to get involved with organizations that exclusively uh, represent the producer. There's a lot of organizations out there that claim to, but, but they um, are not necessarily working for them. Get involved. It's an ongoing fight that can't be handled by a few. It's got to be everybody at the, at the table on it. On it. Whether it's um, your checkoff issues or your country of origin labeling issues or the DOJ investigations or like your 5014 um, and some of those tools that we're working for, you're going to have to work on all, all those fronts because it isn't going to happen on a, on a single front.